Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Zoom In on a Fresh Conversation. It is Monday night all over again, and we thank you for being with us on our last show of the year. I can't believe we've been doing this for a whole year, and everybody who's here today has been involved for this whole year, and I cannot tell you how excited I am for last year and how excited I'm going to be for next year when we start again on January the 10th with Zoom In on a Fresh Conversation. But tonight, it will be up Up next is Mr. Stan Harrison, who he has been here before, everybody. I've interviewed this man more than I've interviewed Derek Trippett, if you believe it or not. <laughs> Mr. Stan <laughs> Harrison, who has been a sponsor for the Fresh Book Festival for the last eight years. I cannot thank him enough. Stan wears many hats, but tonight he is here as an author. Thank you, Stan, for being here tonight. Zoom in on a fresh conversation is sponsored by Eyeless Diamonds LLC, brought to you by Milton McCulloch, author of Love and Emancipation, L.D. Robinson, owner and operator of Adero Press, a Dante production, and the Fresh Book Festival, which is coming up. We're so excited. 678 January 2022. Please purchase your tickets at www.freshbookfestivals.net for all the events freshbookfestivals.net for all the events. If you have any questions for Stan Harrison, please leave them in the chat box. And before we even get into your introduction, manipulation, where did that come? It actually came from uh, just a, what we call a sit down and just think through process. Really? Uh, yeah, I was in my office and I was sharing this with uh, Miss LD a few weeks ago. I pulled out my notes and I began to just do a uh, just evolving, just putting down all the thoughts and ideas that I had in my head regarding what I wanted to say say to the world. Mm. And out of all the ideas, this is the one idea that was unique and it stood out very differently. Uh, so I decided to go with this one. And the MAN was about yeah. it was more than just about the the word. It was about the rebirth and mm. there's a lot of interior nuggets found in this book that you will have to go searching to find them. And once you find them, you actually pick up a trail of pieces to rediscover your life. And that goes for both man and woman in this case. Mm. There's a lot of um, parallel uh, uh, connectivities, uh, matrix, gladiator type. Uh, interchange, if you will, placed in the book. And that was done purposefully so mm. that it's not just a, a novel or a novella. It is a, a, a what I call a, um, a, a mystery or a guide or a uh, just a, right, a mystery. Uh, look and see, look and find. Uh, of course, we know there's a lot of biblical uh, layers that I lay in just about everything. That oh, I do. really? Okay. Mm -hmm. So this one is seek and ye shall find. Mm. And that is deeply, uh, there's different levels and different sections of the book that you have to find certain things um, on purpose. I don't necessarily, I didn't put everything out there. So obviously, uh, just like most writers, most artists, there are some things that are hidden uh, on purpose, allowing the reader in this case uh, an opportunity to go find some things and learn some things about themselves because it will be a direct reflection on you whether um, mm. if you just decide to experience it, it will truly be a reflection. So let's rewind. So everybody, this is Mr. Stan Harrison, <laughs> just went way off script. And I'm going to ask him to introduce himself again to the audience really quick. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, as you know, my name is Stan Harrison. And as Donna mentioned earlier, I do wear many hats. Many hats. Uh, many hats. Uh, but tonight, we're going to focus on my newest hat. Actually, it is my second newest hat because my newest hat is in the room sleeping. Right. Um, but oh. my second newest hat, that's, yes, absolutely. Thanks, Donna. My second newest hat is becoming an author. So this year is a, uh, is a big year for me, 2021. Um, it was a year that I celebrated, you know, one year of being in the office. Um, and I must admit, I did not. It's know been it. a year? It's been almost two years, but this will be the full year 
that we have been the very first African-American owned business on a street typically not uh, open to black business. Um, number two, it's the year that I became a grandfather. Uh, number three, this is the year that I have proposed to my fiance. Uh, uh. Number, four, <laughs> number four is the year that I became an author. So, uh, and number five, that has not happened. That's only in a few more days, but I will be um, the bright age of five zero. Yeah, yeah. All, this beauty, all this beauty in a half a century, right? <laughs> Listen, so what most people had as a setback in 2021 was a setup for you in 2021 for, for so many great things. Wow, that's really nice. Um, and it, it gets even better. Go ahead. But I'll, I'll just stop right there. No, it, it, share. It gets, better. it gets better. This is probably the... Um, the best year that I've ever had in my primary business, wow. um, just in terms of growth and development. Uh, it's been an amazing year, though we have had some struggles, you know, just like everyone else. We have certainly had uh, an amazing year with only eight real business days left. Uh, we have a really, really good shot of making uh, some headways and making New Smyrna Beach proud of what, uh, what we've done here what you've done on Canal Street. <laughs> and you know, that's a daunting task. You know, when you first decided to move to Canal Street, um, that was not something that you just woke up and decided to do. That is correct. Right. That it's something correct. that took some uh, biblical thinking, right? It did. It took uh, a lot. It manipulation. Took a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's uh, the overcoming product. of the manipulation, of course. <laughs> exactly. And so congratulations to you, because that is not a feat that most people can talk about, right? And 2021 was really, really just astronomically good to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, when, I, when I did the promo for this session, I said that you had all these initials behind your name, right? But now, you know, when you're an author, author comes first. So it's author, <laughs> comma, Stan Harrison. And then all the initials come. All the other initials. And, and, a, lot people, and a, a lot of people, Donna, people actually pay attention to, to those initials. Absolutely. And they know exactly what they mean. And, and what they mean is basically I'm a triple master's degree in financial right. services. Right. And that means a lot to a person that's actually looking for someone that they can trust. So exactly. it not only means trust, but it means understanding. It means stability. Uh, it means resourcefulness, and it, it just means that, hey, that's a person that I can go to. So uh, I'm proud to say that, uh, and, and my son is here with us. He was in the room with me. We were in the basement, and we spent four years studying in the basement in order to achieve that. And I hope that gave him an understanding of, you know, there is blood, sweat, and tears in everything that we do, and it takes a while for us to go through that, only to see the fruit in just a few moments. You know, we right. have a lot of we have a lot of uh, work to do, and then we see the fruit in a few moments. Well, let me just say this: those initials do not come without toil and sacrifice. That is true. And, and even becoming an author doesn't. You have to toil, and you have to sacrifice. So everything that's before and after your name is um, noteworthy. Thank you. You know, to a lot to a lot of us, to everybody, actually, everybody who knows you and those who will know you in the future. So the tool, you know, I I did read um, some of it. I'm not going to give it away, of course, but the tool was an amazing journey of um, not I won't call it manipulation, I'll call it osmosis, right? You know, osmosis is when it's, you know, you just bloom and start all over. And so your book, The Tool, is premiering at the Fresh Book Festival, which, you know, I'm really excited about. And so how does it feel to be an author as well as a sponsor this year? That just kind of puts you in two different hats. And for those of you who don't know, he will be the only premiered author at the film festival, which will be at the historic Peabody Auditorium in a historic night 
with an all black sci-fi film. So we're so excited about the melanin that's going to be in that room. And one part of that melanin is going to be Mr. Stan Harrison with his book, The Tool. So tell us, how does it feel to be, because we've been talking about this author thing. Okay. For a long time. A long time. Yeah. And it, 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 it's an osmosis. I mean, and let's face it, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, some people will say, you know, show me the baby, don't tell me the labor pains. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and I must tell you, it this year has been a tremendous amount of labor pains. And up until a few hours ago, LD and I are still dealing with some labor pains. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all need um, to birth this baby in two weeks, I'm telling you. <laughs> I know, I know. We hear you, Miss Tony. <laughs> <laughs> need to birth this baby in two weeks, right, Tony? <laughs> it is, uh, you know, I didn't, I have to give every author, every poet, every person that's ever graced this stage a compliment because each one of them has contributed to my decision to write and going through the process because it truly is a process. Um, just like anything in life, you know, we think it's easy. Uh, we think, oh, you know, that's easy. All you have to do is sit down and write and dedicate about five hours and it's done. No. Uh, this was a tremendous amount of mental labor uh, and I think every single person that put their hands on it uh, said something to me, encouraging, lifted me, uh, rubbed my shoulders when it was tiring, woke me up when it was time to do uh, the conference calls with my ghost writer, Miss Angie. I have to give her a tremendous a lot, uh, amount of credit uh, because, you know, we started this thing. I was traveling uh, in D.C. Uh, celebrating my, my niece's um uh, becoming a sergeant and we started this journey in the hotel room and we started two hours and then the next day another two hours and it went on and on and on and on and on with the editing and it went on for four or five months just conversating and communicating about what the book should look like and what the meaning should be about and then after then we spent another five months just editing going back and forth, making sure there's no typos, making sure that the message that we wanted to send, the message that I wanted to give to the world from my head and from my heart, I wanted to make sure that that message came out very clear. Uh, what I realized is that it, it created something totally new and exciting. I never thought that the journey would be so exciting. So, um, rewarding um it, it, it's almost i feel as if and, and to answer your question it feels like a dream it feels like a dream to be able to support something and then at the same time being a part of it uh so i'll, I'll be i'll wear two hats at the same time in this particular arena so so tell me when you thought you were finished and you weren't finished was that kind of daunting for you when you knew that you had to kind of do it all over, right? It, it was. It mm -hmm. was a tough, tough pill to swallow right. because, of course, you, you figure, hey, you know, I've I'm done. done. I'm done. It's good, done. right? And the book then, is finished. I've inked yeah. it. Now right. it's time to go to print. Right. And then I called this beautiful lady, uh, <laughs> Miss Tony, and she says, uh-uh. That's just part one. You got a lot of work to do. And it was a conversation here on the Fresh Book Festival, or at least on the uh, Fresh Conversation, that because I realized that it's not just a part of writing. Uh, that The writing is just the beginning. And then you have to make sure that your message is clear. Uh, then there's editing. Then there's production. Then there's marketing. Then there's distribution. Then there's how do you collect your money? And it goes on and on and on. And now, uh, thankfully, and I say thankfully, uh, God has placed people in my life to help me along the way and help me with this journey because it is truly a process and it is truly a journey. So I will say this to any writer or any person that's thinking about writing, uh, really consider this a journey. I did not, and not unlike anything that I've ever gone through in life, um, I've learned through the process and no one could have told me exactly what I was going to go through. And for any young person out there, I would tell you that it's no different than anything else in life. No one can tell you everything that you're going to go through. You're right. just going to have to go through it. So 
you're you're going through the journey. I think that what most people don't understand is that you can write a book, but can you write a book in the spirit of excellence? All right. Yeah, you know, when people say to me, oh, every, anybody can write a book. Yeah, you can. But will it be done in the spirit of excellence? Will it be something that when it's being sent to the Library of Congress, it sits well on the shelf and not behind the book, but in front of the book, right? So yeah. that's what, you know, um, and, I, you know, I've been in the game a long time. And so the spirit of excellence didn't come to me until further down the road because we didn't have the end road. So we took, and, you know, I don't want to go left on the conversation, but we took for granted that the people who we were giving money to were looking out for our best interests. When in fact, they absolutely did not look out for our best interests and nor did they care that the book was not done in the spirit of excellence. So what Fresh has decided to do and has, has come about only because of people like Janice Kearney, Tony, LD, um, Milton and others, who have come together and said, okay, let's have a tribe that makes sure that what we do is in the spirit of excellence. It might not always be fantastic. It might not always get the kudos that it, it deserves, but we will know that the product that you put out is excellent. And so that's all you can ask for, right? That's, that's pretty much all you can ask for. So let's talk about that. So when, <laughs> listen, I wrote things in my book that, you know, it's hard to tell your story without telling your story, right? So in telling your story, but not telling your story, how cathartic was that for you? I would have to say it's 100%. 100% because I was able to not only um, tell the story, but I was able to weave in so many different things that I didn't even think would fit. So as we are building and as I'm writing, I'm realizing, wait a minute, that adds to the story. And this also adds to the story. And I was fortunate because I was basically a sponge for many years for a lot of men who have gone through the trauma of divorce and breakup and heartbreak. You and were the couch. I was the couch. You were the couch. <laughs> yes. So I was I was the sponge and I soaked in a lot of a lot of the pain. And I hope that what we have produced is not only mindful, but cathartic to the men that will read and would be a wake-up call to all of us. Um, and that's the whole mission. I wanted it to be a platform so that a platform for healing. I wanted to make sure that I wrote something that wasn't going to be on the, on the level of victimization, mm. but to make sure that it was on uh, the platform of healing and growth. So that was the excellent part of this particular writing and making sure that that was the message. So I'll, I'll spill a little bit down. Go ahead. Regardless I can't what, do it, but you can do it. Absolutely. Regardless <laughs> of what the main character endured, Regardless of the level and the intensity of the manipulation, he persevered. Mm. Is it? Do you think that people find it amazing that men, we, we always hear the story about women, right? We write our story all the time, you know, take your pain, put it on pages and make paper. We cry. Men don't get the chance to do that. So were you surprised at the many men, even in, when you were a couch, that um, were going through so much pain and not able to um, t talk about it, to express their pain, to cry in front of people? And how do we, and, and that's the first question. The second question is, how do we bridge that gap? for men to go through their pain and make paper, you know, you guys can make paper too, and, and not look at, and not be looked at as someone who's soft, right. but someone who's brilliant, right? Excellent questions. Um, the very first thing I would say is that 
uh, about two months ago, I was at a um, just a community meeting where someone was and it was a man who had been who was going through a very, very tough breakup um, and he was in tears and I began to share that I had written this book, but it's not ready yet. And the audience fell in love with the book. The first thing they said is finally something written by a man. Mm. Uh, and the gentleman uh, pulled me away from the crowd later on that afternoon. We spoke several times since. So that answers a lot of questions. We have to stop being afraid uh, of being men. And we have to realize that before we were men, we were, we were human first. Uh, and we have to accept that humanity and we mm. have to really be human um, to be men. And, uh, you know, my brother and I, who is uh, with us today, he and I share a lot of different um, ideas and, and realities of how men don't cry, how, and there was a famous writer that wrote a book, Men Cry in the Dark, mm. and how brothers discuss, um, you know, being strong and how we have to be strong and how we cannot rest. And there's another brother that who is also famous on YouTube who talks about, and he describes uh, the idea of always being tough and not allowing himself to rest and how he was able to have a conversation with his wife um, about whenever he, whenever he hear, hears her come in the home, he jumps up and they had a conversation and she says, I want you to rest. And I, I must admit, you know, like, like most men, including myself, we, you know, when we hear you coming in the door and when we know that you're going to be nearby, we don't want to be viewed as lazy. Mm. And, and, I, and, and before I go any further here, I must create a disclaimer, and I, I do differentiate men and males. Um, when, I, when I speak, I, I'm not talking about males. I'm only talking about men. Uh, I only deal with in, in, in men. I don't deal in males. And, and a male is a, 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 a person who, who looks like a man, but he lacks the responsibility. Um, and some of these, again, these deep uh, level uh, understandings are, are embedded in the book and how as a woman and, and as women, these are, these are the types of things to look for mm -hmm. in a man so that you're not bamboozled or uh, manipulated yourself into believing that a person is a man just because they possess the physical attributes of a man, but they are a man because of their level of responsibility and their ability to love you and how, the, how they generated that ability through a higher source. So it's, it's a lot deeper than just, you know, the idea of um, just being a physical person. So a physical being, if you will. So when mentally, right, it's got to be soothing just to have some of it off of your chest, right? Just away from you. And, and when you, when you, once you decided to do that, right? And you set that right here. What do you do with that? Is it still there? Or what are you doing with that? Don, it's no different than dealing with any type of pain or PTSD or whatever we deal with in life. Um, it's called life. You know, and we have to go through it. Uh, what happens in a lot of cases with men is that there's, there has really been no platform for us to deal with that. Type right. of stuff. Uh, we, you know, and I, I, briefly describe that in the book. Um, in fact, in the introduction, I talk about that because that's something that I wanted to bring out in the beginning, how there is no platform for us. It's either, you know, live and let live or, you know, you know, as another famous person uh, sometimes uh, reiterates, you know, get rich or you die trying. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's that, you know, a lot of men, that's how we, you know, that's how we operate. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the only way, but we've either accepted, we're either going to do it one way or the other way, but there's a lot of different ways in between and we have to open ourselves up. So the idea is we have to be open and we have to be vulnerable enough to Receptive. dwell in that, dwell in that pain. Uh, pain does create a level of healing. 
sometimes we don't, and, and men don't, we're, we're just not comfortable in pain. Uh, we rather just, you know, move on really quickly and not deal with it. And that's one of the biggest, biggest things that you'll see. Uh, one of those deeper level concepts in the book that we just brush it under the rug and we move on re relatively quickly. Without when when you're looking at, I don't know if it's going to be called Tool 2 or whatever, whatever the second book is, I'm sure it's going to come really soon. Are you thinking about maybe helping people more work bookish? Like I can read the book, right? But what's going to help me get through it? I see what you went through and I went through it and my brother went through it. But what is the exercise to help me? Because I can't be enough, right? So, you know, when you go to your second level, third level, I really want you to think about how you can help a man in a situation by just writing it out or thinking it through, a workbook. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Just, yeah. Go ahead. And you've actually touched on um, a little bit of part two and oh. part three and oh. the workbook that uh -oh. is supposedly going to go along with it. So that is actually part of the plan. It's part of the process because as I am writing, what I'm learning is that, is that there's so many things that I've forgotten about in terms of uh, the growth and the development and how I've been able to help people through my career. And I've primarily been a, uh, a surgeon, and I mean a master surgeon right. when it comes down to finances. Uh, how do I take that knowledge and wisdom and how do I transition that to the healing of, of, of the heart? Uh, because, you know, with men, it's, it's very tough. And the reason why it's so tough with men is that it's difficult for us to open up. So the biggest part is opening our, our brains, opening our hearts. And there's a few uh, religious leaders in our world today who are masterful at opening our hearts. The problem is how do we sustain that? How do we not only open, but how do we sustain it? And it's not easy. Now, and it, it's not a you know one size fits all type of scenario. So it will take some work. And I don't I don't want to just do it where it's from my ideas and my thought process. It truly will be a community effort. And a lot of brothers who who know me and love me. Uh, will take part in this process and, and they will contribute and it will be um, uh, our stamp on this world. We will make a stamp and we will uh, create a mission uh, and a passion for, for men to overcome because we all go through it. It's part, of, it's part of life. So how do you go through it? How do you deal with it? And how do you move on? Um, one of the biggest things and I'm just going to plug here, one of the biggest okay. things that we learned is that as we go through things, we get a little softer. Um, how do we learn? How do we, you know, and I think there's a, there's a term, uh, there's an analogy that says, you know, there's a ball and pot of water and you have an egg, you have a carrot and you have something else that goes in it. And it's an egg, it's a carrot and it's grounded coffee in that ball and pot of water. Uh, when the grounded coffee goes in, it's dry. When it comes out, it's coffee. When that carrot goes in, it's hard. It comes out soft. When that egg goes in, it goes in hard, but it comes out soft. So the reality is, or it's a soft egg and then it comes out hard. The reality is the water changed the egg. It changed the carrot, but the coffee changed the water. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you need to write that down. Where is that written down somewhere? Did you just make that up? <laughs> <laughs> that, that may be book three. <laughs> I love it. And so I think, you know, what I see from the development in this book is that you are going to do workshops and give men a safe space, right? It's, it's the problem is no one, a gentleman said to me one day, well, Donna, what do you need? And I said, I need to feel safe. Ooh. Right. I need to feel safe. And if you can develop that, if you can give me that, we're good. And if you can give those men a safe space to know that, you know, it's one thing to have a conversation. It's a whole nother story for you to develop a workshop where men are on the ground sniffing carpet, right? 
And yeah. knowing that once they walk out the room, you leave it there. Absolutely. The safe space. So there's so much you can do uh, with the development of your books. Um, it's just amazing. And I mean, listen, you, you have the, the ability to take this thing where no man is supposed to go. <laughs> And men of melanin, right? right? This is what I'm talking about. Uh, right. Most, not say most, some white men do have an outlet. Um, but our black men don't seem to have any outlet to feel safe, right? And it's hard for them to even tell you. Like, I, I don't think a man would ever say, if I said to you, what do you need? The last thing he would say to me is, I need to feel safe. And why do you think that is? Well, because that's important. Traditionally, a man has been the person or, um, you know, that thing that has created the safety. You know, men do two things. We protect and we provide. But the question is, and, I, and where you're going with this, is who protects us? And the reality is, there's traditionally been no one in particular right. that has protected us other than the God Almighty. Right. Um, however, however, uh, there is a new idea and a new understanding that we have to be each other's keeper. And there is a level of trust that goes along with that. So in order to be vulnerable, we have to trust each other. And it, it, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if, you know, if I need help, there should be some other brother there to help me and to talk me off the ledge. Because the reality is when we look at sisters, sisters have a network. Man. Y'all have 20 people that, you know, right. will be there and cry on your shoulder or you right. guys flop. It's not everybody's not everybody, crying. Everybody's crying. But men, it's a different ball game. Mm -hmm. We don't have that network because when we begin uh, to sob, you know, there is that stigma that says you're soft you're weak no man cries you know hey get on up and let's go you know your arm is broken all right here's some tape and that's been the way that we've healed yeah. uh, i mean you look at sports like the nfl um in any sport it's archaic we play to win <laughs> yes. and we play hard right and we play hurt and that's how we do in life. Um, the reality is I, I can have the same pains that a female can have and a female can take the day off work. Right. But me with the same pains, my stomach hurts. That's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, you'll be you'll be viewed uh, uh, much differently. And here is here is the truth. It's supposed to be that way. Mm -hmm. I can't have there is truly no equality in life. And any man that says to you that there should be equality, check his man code or check right. his, uh, you know, his, his man. Uh, he's more like a male. And I'll, I'm going to say that again. He's more like a male than a man. Well, I mean, I don't, you know, I know that you and Malik have a great um, relationship, but what, what an inspiring thing you can do for the young man that Malik is holding, right? You can give him a whole different perspective about what it's like to be a man in this, this new generation. So when you, okay, so <laughs> you're a writer now, right? Yes. So tell us how your writing process, you thought you were gonna write, how you thought you were gonna write, and how has that changed now that you have gone through the process? I thought I was going to write, <laughs> I was going to publish, and I was going to make a million dollars in a month. Right, bro. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. And one, <laughs> so, I would say, <laughs> so I would say that the first um, three chapters, we probably scrapped those three chapters three or four times mm. in the beginning. And then we start learning, or at least I learned what I was doing and what I was doing wrong. And, and then I opened up and then I began to flow and the pieces started coming together. 
Um, but once we, you know, once the book was finished, and then I said, great, we're done. Now it's time to go to publishing and make a lot of money. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. <laughs> then it was stage, you know, stage left. What am I doing? What did I get myself into? You know, I began to pull out my hair and um, wonder why did I do this? And, but I kept the focus on, I have to tell this story. I have to get it out. It has to be excellent. It has to be something that's going to be beneficial for the world. And because of that, my uh, crying lasted a split second. So it did not take me long to realize that if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. And I had a lot of support. And I have not shared the story, but I had uh, one of my Fab Six, who, who's a friend of mine, his name is Jim. Uh, he actually flew down from Kansas mm. and came to my office and picked me up. And I began to tell him the first chapter of the story. And I said, I'm not, I don't want to write this book. And he looked me in the eye and said, the world needs to hear that. And he inspired me to actually do it. And this was January, 2021. So, and then of course, a week later, the Fresh Book Festival, we had our first Fresh Book Festival virtual. Virtual. And, and I think I called you and asked you for your input and, and you immediately said, do it. Do it. And here we are December. And thanks to Miss LD who cleaned all this up. Um, as of midnight tonight, we're going into pre-sales. Nice. Nice. On your website? On the website. Okay, good. So good. you can order your, the tool book, 12 Midnight Tonight. At? At thetoolmanipulation.com. Thetoolmanipulation.com. So when you talk about writing style, how are you going to write differently for book two? Because I yeah. think that you're kind of helter-skelter the first time. So have you, have you found your flow? Have you found your style? No. <laughs> no. I have not. Uh, because, you know, as, as, as a financial person, my style is so... Um, is it rigid? It's very rigid. Yeah. Very, you got, so you got the... To, you got the I, have, I have to yeah. fight to get it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. So a lot of what you read is really pulling out of me. It, it was actually pushed out um, in order for it to land on paper. And honestly, when I, when I read it the first time, I was on my way, I flew from Florida to Kansas City for a funeral. Mm. And I read the book from beginning to end the first time. And I actually cried on the plane. Mm. And it was, uh, it took a lot out of me um, to realize that this actually came out. Um, so it was, it was very deep. So I have no idea what my style is going to be. Uh, however, I know that my, uh, the purpose of the book, that's what I'm focused on. The purpose of the book. The purpose of the book. And, but I think it'll be different for book two and three, just because you won't be writing for yourself. Right. Right. You'll be writing for yourself and others. Well, because believe it or not, Donna, believe it or not, book one was hard because I had so much material. Yeah. So many stories. <laughs> and when I tell you <laughs> so many stories and, and they, and, and had I put all the stories in, the book would not have flowed. Right. So I had to cut out a lot of stories that I thought were very dramatic and impactful. However, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of keep it where the reader would have an easy, you know, an easy read or easier read. And the, and the, and the mission of the book was to really get out there that, Hey, you can, you can overcome this. You, you can get through this. Um, so the whole idea is just installation of faith, instant faith. Instant faith. Um, and I said that three times for a reason, so that we can get it. 
So do you think that your biblical references will maybe deter some people from reading the book? Not at all. Because I did not preach. I dropped them and I moved on very fast for the purposes of not dwelling on what the word is. However, dwell on the purpose of the word. And there is no works without faith and <laughs> works without faith is dead. Right. Or faith without works is that however you want to put it, the idea is that you have to move. There has to be action behind your thoughts. There has to be action behind your beliefs and there has to be action behind your faith. So the whole idea is you got to do something with it. You can't just sit there and sit on it. Uh, my entire life has been about action. I have not had the most beautiful life. Um, it, it has been filled with, you know, just like any, any other life. I mean, I'm, I'm no different than anybody else. Uh, uh, and, and there's no real difference. It is what it is. You know, I'm just me. And, you know, I've been blessed beyond measure, of course. Um, and I've had my share of uh, falling off trees and scraping my knees and breaking a few bones along the way. Uh, and my heart's been broken multiple times. Mm. So this type of writing was easier because I've had the experience. Um, and I, I don't come from a perspective of hurting another person. Because hurt people, or shall I say, hurting people, hurt people. I want to break that chain. And I want us to get back to a place where you don't have to be hurt. Um, heal before you hurt other people. And, and oftentimes... I didn't tell you that you're either the moderator for that particular workshop, did I? So you I, know, I, everybody, you know that today. Everybody, you know today. <laughs> voluntold, I see. <laughs> You and the other man that I hold in highest esteem is Mr. Derek Tripp. So you guys will be doing that workshop together. Awesome. And, and yeah, I think that could be no better. Yeah, um, because of where, you know, of where you both have been. So, and hurt people, hurt people. Hurt hurting people, hurt, people, hurting hurt. people, hurt people. And, and as men, it, it's challenging to see other men hurting people. And some of those people that they hurt are the women that you love. And it's hard to deal with a man in that same respect. So full disclosure, um, my biological father was a hurting man. Right. And he did some hurt. He did some, you know, he, he caused some pain. I won't get into the details. Right. But, but I will say that had he received some help, um, you know, my life could have been a hundred percent different had he received some help, had someone tapped him on the shoulder, had someone give him a hug um, and, and told him that he was loved and someone cared about him. Uh, we need that as men. We need it. Uh, the world needs it. The world need, needs a hug. We have to break the cycle, the chains, right, of emotional um abuse for men and women and it, it all starts with us because what you what you have to do is think about every word you say right because words you cannot take back absolutely and words um, do matter people words, say sticks and stones oh, may break my bones but words mm -hmm. never hurt whoever says they do that, absolutely words, do words you do know and, and what has happened is that a lot of times the other party or the female party in a lot of respects has been the victim of a lot of abuse and unbeknownst to her she becomes the hurt person that then hurts other people right so it's a cycle and it goes yeah. both ways it goes both ways i was uh having a brief conversation with a young lady from india and she said you know donna you you're an african-american female but just think about when anybody introduces you in your family and they say, oh yeah, she's really smart for the black man wow. from India. So when we talk about how words don't destroy you, right? Here she is, I think we're about the same age and she still has a conversation about how people introduced her as really, really smart to be the black man. 
in India, well, you know, and that's the cold caste system. But right. words really do hurt. They really do. Okay, we so have to learn to, we have to learn to use our words to heal. <laughs> I'm going to need 16 copies of the book when I come to Fresh. Thank you, Mama Tony. Thank There's you, your first you. sales, right? Um, okay, so we're going to kind of wind this up. Tell me um, for our seasoned veterans and for our aspiring authors, give us three lessons that you learned, if you could. I would say lesson number one is truly have your thoughts, cohesive thoughts together. Um, I learned this from Fresh. Know what you want to say in the beginning, the middle, and the end of the book. And number three, I learned this from another beautiful young lady here, is that know how you're going to market the book. Have a marketing plan set, know who your audience is, know who your, uh, the people who are going to buy, know those people and know them well and make those inroads while you are writing and don't wait till the very last minute. Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we'll forgive you if, you, the, <laughs> if things just fall away. But, you know, listen, things happen. So exactly. um, I think that if you can um, have your pre-sales ready, right, it would be great, right? Um, and a couple of books, you know, maybe we'll have as many as you want, but as many as you have, we'll get rid of. How about that? Absolutely. So when, um, did we, did I touch on everything? Is there anything else you'd like to share with me? Us, the audience. This is the end of the year. Um, and and you you had a fabulous 2021. I don't know what you could ask for for 2022. But if you had, you know, I, I love the song, uh, When You Wish Upon a Star. Doesn't matter where you are. So tell me what. You can't have a better wish list than 2021, but tell me, if you did, what would that be? Oh, wow. Um, you know, this process, because I've been asked multiple times, uh, what do you want for Christmas? And the answer is nothing. Right. Everything a man could have ever asked for, I have. Uh, there is nothing in the stores, and I've tried. I've gone into multiple stores over the past few months trying to shop for those that I love and appreciate. Um, the The one thing that 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 I want more than anything else, Donna, is just to to give more. Mm. In fact, I demonstrated. I had an opportunity to demonstrate that today. Uh, I had a chance to purchase four learning pads for mm. kids, and that I posted that on my Facebook only a few hours ago. I had these kids. Um, that were part of the uh, Southeast Volusia County uh, parades and mm. they received golden tickets and it was like a, uh, oh, yeah. a reflection of the uh, Willy Wonka type and these kids won these golden tickets and they were able to win these prizes uh, for Christmas and it was indeed a Christmas gift for kids who would not have had the opportunity to have these items so being a participant in that was just it, it just warmed my heart knowing that these kids will receive a, a, a warm Christmas as a result of, of the work that we put in. And giving to those who don't have is really the greatest gift that I could receive. Do we have any questions? Um, please, now is the time. I'm going to take him up, put him on gallery. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Harrison before we go? Only that to whom much is given, much is required, my friend. All right. So let's least not let's we not forget that. Um, and I don't think you're one to do that since you teach people how to fish and you teach people how to manage their money and you teach people to understand that uh, cash app is not how you get buried. <laughs> so, go go fund me is go not fund me, a plan. right? It's just not I'll how we should again. be. No, go fund me is not a burial plan. <laughs> It's not how we should be uh, living our lives. For those who don't know, Mr. Stan Harrison uh, is the owner-operator of a state farm uh, franchise on Canal Street in the beautiful city of New Smyrna Beach on top of everything else that he does. And of course, contact him with any financial needs that you might have. 
and insurance needs. So uh, your pearl of wisdom, please. Pearl of wisdom today is something that I've been thinking about for a while. I've, uh, I've been exposed to uh, what we call um, uh, television, uh, the, pro, the, new, the new age programming, <laughs> which is reality. So I have a few things to say. Okay. <laughs> I want the audience to understand that this is scripted and this is designed to be weak. The characters are designed to be weak. Don't let this be your guide. Mm. Strength is what we need, not crime. We need to be strong. But in your vulnerability, there is a thin line, the silver lining of strength. So don't allow these television personalities to tear you down, to let you think that their immature, weak personalities is what we should strive for. It is not. It is strength. We have to be stronger and we can't let, whether it be television, uh, social media, whatever, we have to be stronger than that, folks. So my pearl of wisdom is simple. Be stronger than that. Mm, stronger than that. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Yeah, I, you know, I'm blessed not to have a television, so I don't really get into any of that real life TV. But yes, I, I, I do believe that what I have seen um, is less than intelligent and something that we should not be spending a whole lot of my time on. So. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Harrison, my friend of many, many years. Uh, thank you all for being with us this entire year. I, I just can't tell you how much it's meant to me. Uh, the YouTube station is doing very, very well. We have to make literacy a legacy. We have to make literacy a legacy because if we don't, we're gonna lose some people. We're gonna leave some people behind and young people and we don't wanna do that. So from the Fresh Book family, happy new year, Merry Christmas, and we will see you all in January and at the Fresh Book Festival. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Mama Tony, appreciate it. Good night, Janice, Willie, Angel, Patricia, LD, Milton, Miss Warner, thank you so much for being here. Eldridge, thank you for being here. Oh, that's the mama. Hey, mama. She's beautiful. So thank you, guys. Good night. Good night.